Greetings. Welcome to Electron Networking for Home and Small Businesses. Today, uh, in this lecture, I'm going to explain the concept of networking and what the benefits of networking are. I'm going to go over the concept of communication protocols and why they're important. We're going to talk about a local Ethernet network, which is what most of us will commonly come encounter with at home or at a small business. I'll describe devices that work at a network and what their common responsibilities are. We'll talk about distribution layer devices and how they communicate across networks. And at the very end, we'll talk about planning and implementing and verifying a local area network. This will introduce an activity uh, that you'll be required to complete as part of this week's lesson. First off, uh, networking basically means connecting uh, computing devices together so that they can share resources. So that is the definition of that is changing really rapidly. Today we have computer networks, video networks, voice networks. We even have entertainment uh, set, set, uh, equipment. We also have mobile devices, wireless devices. All of these now are connecting together and converging in, in a larger information network. So in a small home or office, you'll typically have phones, computers, video, uh, and a variety of other things all using the same network. So network is the, basically the ability for all of these devices to share the same resource. Now, oftentimes that, that resource is the internet, but that resource can also be a thing such as a, uh, uh, a storage, uh, some place to share data to, like a, a NAS or network attached storage device. It could also be the internet itself, or it could be uh, uh, maybe a server you want to talk to, or a variety of other things. There, there are many different types and sizes of networks. <coughs> A small home office network is what some of you may have, uh, which is basically your computer and perhaps a mobile device or tablet uh, connected to a network um, and then has many resources such as a printer or, uh, or um, uh, network attached storage, like I said before, or other types of things, sometimes a media server. <coughs> At a small office, you'll usually have multiple machines and phones uh, connected together. Uh, and they can communicate and share resources, such as a shared printer or other things. In a larger network, you usually have servers and applications that everybody is sharing, and application data will sit on the server. And of course, in very large enterprise networks or in worldwide networks, you'll have many branch offices connecting to maybe a larger corporate office. <clears throat> so there are many components that can be obviously a part of this network. You can have switch, uh, the main components are. Uh, switches, uh, routers, and servers, and then of course your computer devices themselves. Of course you can also have devices such as a webcam or a network printer or a scanner device or anything else like that. But these are all devices that connect together and they make up the components of a network. Uh, clients and servers are two of the biggest roles that computers will play on a network. It's usually called a client server network. Basically you have a server that serves some vital roles such as handling email, web traffic, files, and then you have your clients that will have some sort of client software on, on them that can connect to that server and uh, uh, use that information. Such as I would have a, a, a browser, a web browser sitting on my PC or desktop or Mac or whatever and it would connect to and view data on a web server my email client uh, which might be my Gmail interface or or my um, Outlook uh, would connect to an email server and download email and then of course you might have some way of browsing files on a file access client accessing a file server Peer-to-peer uh, -peer networking is probably the most basic way of doing networking, and that is simply connecting a couple of PCs together and sharing data. For example, let's say uh, two computers wanted to share the same printer. Uh, that might be a, a simple thing to do. Or maybe there's a file on one computer that I want to share with another. This is called a peer-to-peer -peer type of network. Most small uh, uh, networks uh, will have this going on all the time especially if I want to copy one file over to the other machine or if I want to use another machine's printer. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks are easy. They're, very, they're not very complex at all. They're pretty low cost. They don't require any special device. Um, 
and it's used for very simple things. But you know, you can't administer it. It's not really secure. Uh, usually, uh, we don't. I mean, last time I did this at home, I didn't use a password. I just want to get the file over the computer. Uh, it's not something you can add a lot of machines. You couldn't possibly do this with hundreds and hundreds of machines. So we, we call it, it, we say that it's not scalable, meaning that you can't just keep adding machines and adding machines because it'd become too unwieldy to manage. Uh, and so, and, and then also, you know, uh, as these machines start sharing more stuff with other computers, they would start to slow down. So peer-to-peer -peer networking is usually what we use at home. There are many different types of topologies that we would deal with in networking. Uh, and, and we're not going to dive into that here in this particular discussion, but you, you usually have a physical and a logical topology. The physical topology is actually how things are connected up. As you can see in the diagram up in the top here, you'll see that uh, the computers are connected to either hubs or switches, uh, and then these are connected to a router, and that goes out to the Internet. So this is how it's physically connected. Whereas a logical topology shows you, uh, hey, they're logically connected to the same network, and then on a logical topology I'm, I'm, topology, I'm able to give you what its address is. In this case, it's called an IP address, which is the logical address that identifies that machine on the network. <clears throat> the concept of an internet protocol address, or IP address, introduces communication protocols. Uh, Communication protocols are very important. Um, the, one of the primary requirements, such as with the IP protocol, is to identify the source and destination. So just like in human communication, when I pick up my phone and I want to call, let's say I want to call my friend Dwight, I would look up Dwight's information uh, in here and I would get a number for Dwight and I would click send and, and then I could talk to Dwight. Uh, so therefore, in order to talk to Dwight, I had to know his destination number. Well, the same thing is the way it works in IP addressing. In order for two machines to talk, you have to have the destination address, and the, the destination device has to know your address so that you can talk. And so basically what happens is the message, is uh, the source message is encoded, transmitted across some media, and then it's received and decoded at the other end the message is received. This is basically communication protocols. Now, Communication protocols handle all of those, and not the same protocol handles all those roles. Many different protocols handle each of those different elements that was just described. So protocols follow rules, and rules are very important. Rules that would impact, such as the message format. Uh, rules that would impact how the message is encapsulated. Uh, prepared, encapsulated basically means how it is prepared to be sent across the network media. Rules about how big or small the message can be. Rules about how fast or slow or in what sequence it could be sent. And then finally, rules about how it's encoded uh, or maybe it's even encrypted. So these are all rules that protocols need to set up. If two, two machines are talking and they're following different rules, it's a very difficult conversation to have. For example, if I were to call my friend Dwight again, get on the phone with Dwight, and Dwight is speaking uh, French and I'm speaking English, and I don't know French. Well, the conversation will be very difficult indeed because we're speaking two different languages. Same thing here. Protocols usually have to be used that are the same on both sides in order for you to communicate. So, uh, for example, <clears throat> um, uh, in relation to human communication, uh, here's an example. You know, uh, two people trying to communicate. One person's thinking of one thing, and one person might be thinking of another. And so it's very important uh, it, it, for one person, uh, it, you know, as I've got an idea in my head, uh, I have to convert that idea uh, to some sort of uh, language, and then I have to transmit that idea to the person I'm trying to communicate with. I could transmit it via letter, via an email, via text, via phone call. Uh, I have all sorts of different ways. No matter what I choose, it's going to be sent across some sort of media, and then the other person needs to have a way to receive it, decode it, and receive the message, right? So that you can imagine how that happens in human communication. Uh, same thing has to happen in networking. Same exact uh, flow of communication. Okay? Messages sent on networks are always encapsulated, which means they are put together in what is called a frame. Uh, a frame is what is sent out on the network. 
there are some important concepts that are into a frame. One of the things are the destination address. A frame has to know where to send it, and it has to know where it came from. It has to know when it started and when it stops, and it also has to have information about you know, what happens if this message gets corrupted or, or there's an error with it, what to do, or how do you find out if this message is an error. So these are things that happen when networking communication is put into a frame or prepared for delivery. This is called encapsulation. Uh, communicate messages always have size restrictions depending on the, si the channel you're sending across. If you're sending the message across a very fast network, um, or a very fast network with large amounts of bandwidth, then of course the message size can be much larger. But if I'm sending across the network media that may be slower or error prone, then I may want to send the messages in much smaller chunks. So we typically enforce restrictions on how big the message can be when it is sent between machines. Timing is also important. Uh, protocols have to time when things are sent and in what order they're sent. Um, this, this is the same in human communication. You know, uh, you know, I call my friend Dwight, and I usually greet Dwight with, Hello, Dwight, how are you? And I'm basically indicating to Dwight that I would like to start a conversation. If I'm really polite, I might even ask, Hey, Dwight, do you have time to talk? And then Dwight would respond back, Well, yes, I do. And then I can proceed to have my conversation. I also have courtesy on my phone call when I'm done, I let Dwight know, hey, Dwight, I'm done talking now. Uh, I need to end this conversation. And so I do, and we, we have our beginning, uh, our middle, and our end. Well, the same thing happens in network communication. Machines can't just suddenly start talking. they got to let somebody know they're talking. Uh, and then after that, they've got to have some rules established about their communication in terms of timing and the sequence. Now, when we do send messages on the network, there are many different types of messages. Um, the, three, the three messages are called unicast, multicast, and broadcast. A unicast is when I'm having, an, uh, it, for example, uh, in interpersonal communication. So if I pick up my phone and I have a conversation with Dwight and just Dwight, that is a unicast. I'm having a one-to-one -one conversation with Dwight. So in the computer world, that would be from machine to machine. Two machines are talking, nobody else. A multicast would be for me to, to uh, for example, get on a microphone, a PA here at the school, and I pick up the, mic, the PA and I start talking into it, and everybody on the campus can hear. Now, people can choose not to listen, or they could listen, and Dwight might be one of those. So I could hold, the, have a conversation, I could say, this message is for Dwight. I am telling Dwight, blah, 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 blah. And everybody hears it, and some people can listen, some people cannot, but the point is that my one communication goes to many, which is a multicast. And so uh, multicast is a very common method of communication and networking as well, when one message from one machine needs to go to many, but not all. A broadcast is when it goes to everybody. Uh, a good broadcast, for example, would be when I open up my email client and I send an email here at the, at the, at the college to everyone. So I send an email to everyone, it goes out to everybody, and everybody receives it. Everybody gets it. That's called a broadcast. Um, broadcasts tend to take up room and space, and they cause noise. People normally don't like broadcasts, but and broadcasts are almost always one directional. I'm just sending out. Uh, but the same thing happens in networking. PCs sometimes need to get a message out to everybody, and that's called a broadcast. So your three types, unicast, multicast, and broadcast. So we have lots of things that go on in, in networking and with protocols. So protocols have all these things involved. Uh, and, and so you can see that the way I would talk to other people is very much the same way that computers would talk to other computers. It follows roughly the same pattern in the fact that I need proper timing. I need the proper size of the message. Um, I need uh, it to be encapsulated correctly, formatted correctly, and so forth. Um, devices on a network must be sharing common protocols in order for them to talk. Meaning both computers or all the computers on a network need to share common protocols and follow the same rules or otherwise they're unable to communicate. Okay. Now in the early 70s 
we had networking uh, methodologies designed by a variety of vendors. IBM, Xerox, DEC, HP, all, the, all these different vendors uh, created their own proprietary protocols for communicating on their proprietary networks. In the 80s and 90s, we started coming up with standards and we developed things like Ethernet or ArcNet or TokenRing. These were standard methods of communicating. Of course, over time, we grad gravitated towards a common protocol that everybody shared. And so for now, the common networking protocol is now called Ethernet. All the other ones have kind of gone away, and now everybody uses Ethernet. Ethernet has a very special address. Um, this is a, a physical address, oftentimes referred to as a MAC address or a Media Access Control address. This is a physical address that each machine has. The physical address allows two machines on an Ethernet network to talk to each other in a unicast methodology. So I can send a unicast frame from machine to machine uh, in uh, Ethernet network. In order for this to happen, everybody must have their own unique physical address. <clears throat> so Ethernet has some basic characteristics that are pretty common. Uh, all of these impact those things that we were talking about, timing, sequencing, encapsulation, all those things. So Ethernet has a preamble and a start frame delimiter, which basically lets the machine know the message is coming. It has a MAC address, a source and a destination, basically uh, who I'm sending to and who it's coming from. It has a length uh, and a type field, and it has a check sequence at the end so that I can make sure that the frame made it there in the correct package. It's also limited to 1500 bytes, which means I cannot send a frame size larger than 1500, uh, 1500 bytes unless I've got some special provision. So in networking, uh, as our networks get bigger and bigger and bigger, we need to have different methodologies for deploying networks. Now, obviously in our home network, it could be small peer to peer, but as we grow, we have different layers or hierarchical designs in our network planning. Because networks get complicated, we have to have a way to handle the distribution, access, and management or core of our network. So as the network grows, such as like a network here at the college, we have a very much larger, more hierarchical design in networking. Okay, now the MAC address I told you about, that's the physical address that is used in the Ethernet frame to create a unicast frame between two devices. We also have another address called an IP address. This is a logical address. This logical address identifies your computer on the network. Later in an exercise, you're going to be obtaining the IP address on your machine, and we're going to talk about how to diagram that. But basically, the logical IP address allows your machine to communicate from end to end. And when I mean end to end, I mean from your machine to any other computer on the IP network, which would be basically any computer on the internet. So you have an address that identifies you end to end on the network or on the internet. Okay? So uh, at the access layer in a hierarchical network design, uh, Ethernet serves a very important role and that it provides switching devices or hubs, um, usually switches or hubs. Uh, nowadays, we use mainly switches. The hubs are kind of defunct. But the idea is that switches provide many ports to connect your computers to. Uh, you probably have one of these at home. Uh, follow the network wire or go to your wireless device. And you have a little device that has many ports on the back that you can plug into. They look kind of like telephone jacks, but they're a little bit bigger. We call them RJ45. Uh, you're able to plug in many devices into this. So the access layer provides us the ability to connect many machines together. Every network has an access layer, whether it be a small home office or whether it be larger. There's usually a switching or a hub device that connects many machines together. Now, a hub um, basically um, only allows one machine to communicate at a time. And basically, every uh, communication is treated as a broadcast, whether it is or isn't. So if a source machine sends to a hub, the hub's going to send to everybody, but only the destination will be able to receive it. Uh, hubs, because of this, we no longer use them anymore because they're slow, they cause a lot of traffic on our network, and we just don't like them anymore. So consequently, you will have in your network right now at home a thing called a switch. Now sometimes switches are built into the back of your router, 
perfectly okay. Uh, but switches have a little bit more intelligence, meaning when the source sends into the switch, the switch has a what we call a MAC table. And that table allows us to decide uh, where to send it to exactly to get to that destination. So the other machines will not get the communication, only that destination machine, because it has this thing called a MAC table. So this is why switches are preferred, because it cleans up communication, reduces the amount of communication going to machines that shouldn't get it. And so switches are very common. In fact, we use switches everywhere we, everywhere we go now. So another thing you might want to consider is a thing called a broadcast domain. A broadcast domain is where when your machine sends out a broadcast, not a unicast, a broadcast, a broadcast domain means all the machines that are able to receive it. So in your home network, when your machine sends out a broadcast, every machine in your home network can see it because they're on the same switch, but those broadcasts do not go out to the internet. The router prevents those broadcasts from going out into the internet only the machines in your home network are able to see those broadcasts. This is referred to as a broadcast domain. So you may need to expand your network. Maybe expand your network to connect to the internet. Maybe expand your network to connect to another, uh, uh, another office or a branch office or somewhere like that. And this requires the distribution layer. The distribution layer involves things called routing devices. And routing devices take the communication from your network uh, and puts them through the router and sends them on to the destination network. In your home office, everyone has a router. The router separates you, your access network, all of your communications in the same broadcast domain, separates those from the other computers and things on the internet. So the distribution layer is something where you involve devices called routers. Okay, Routers um, basically uh, take a look at the destination address, in this case the destination IP address, and they look at the network the IP address. Now if you look at this example right here, the router is smart enough to look at that IP address and determine which portion of that address is the network and which portion is the host. In this case, it's able to identify that needs to go to the network 192.168.1, and then it can figure out using a routing table where to send that to. And so routers are ver use the destination IP address to determine where in the world does this destination frame or packet need to go. So uh, in your home office network, you usually have only one router. And because of that, that router acts as your main distribution point. All of the computers in your home network will have a thing called a default gateway. That default gateway will be the IP address of your routing device. They will all use the same one. And the reason for this is if your machines are looking to get to a remote network, but your machines do not know where the remote network is, they will forward it to the router, which is the default gateway, and then the router will then know what to do with it because the router can look at the IP address and determine which portion of that is the network uh, ID and then forward it appropriately. Okay. <clears throat> now, the router maintains a thing called a routing table. The routing table tells it which network addresses go to which direction. So if I had a simple network like this, where a router separated two broadcast domains, um, then basically that router would know that the one network over on one side was the 10.0.0.0 network, and on the other side you have the 172.16.0.0 network. It would know that those were separate networks, and it would have a routing table to indicate such. Routers also keep a thing called an, uh, uh, an ARP table. An ARP table matches the Ethernet MAC address with the IP address. So it creates a relationship between that Ethernet MAC uh, and the logical IP. The reason it does this is so that the router, when it receives communication for an address such as 10.1.21.1, it would know exactly what MAC address to put on the frame to get it to that particular IP address. Okay. Now, a very special term that we use in Ethernet networking is called LAN, or Local Area Networking. 
Land is what we all have in our homes. Land is basically where we have machines connected to switching devices all in the same network, and that is called a LAN. The second we get to a router and they go out to the world, we're no longer in the LAN. So the LAN is always the locally connected devices to the same switch or same set of switches. Okay? So your network is your local network, and then you have a thing called a remote network. So a remote network would be beyond your router, and the local network would be whatever's close within your own broadcast domain. Okay? That's pretty much it. Uh, the next few, we're going to have a couple of exercises with this week's lesson. One of the exercises is going to have you use this tool called Packet Tracer. And we're going to have you just have some fun with Packet Tracer, designing a small network. Don't panic. This is just for fun. We're also going to have you plan and implement and design your own local network. I'm going to have you use a tool called Microsoft Visio. And using Visio, I'm going to have you gather information about your home network and put it in a Visio diagram and submit that to us as an exercise. Even the most, now this may be way more complicated than your network right here, but this is what it looks like. Your network diagram for your home will have some required elements. It'll have to have computing devices, a router, and a switch. Sometimes the router and switch may be combined. You may also include a server if you have one. Uh, sometimes people do. You can include printers if you have them. Uh, you might want to include media devices if you have them. And you can also include wireless access points if you have those as well. All right. So you will most likely have a multi-function device in your house. A multi-function device is a device that has both routing, switch, and access point all built into one device. Because this device is capable of all three things. Most of you that have Verizon or some of the service provider will have a multi-function device like this. Here's a close-up look of a Linksys model one. And you can see the yellow ports right there are the switch ports. The blue port right there is the internet port. So it's both a switch and a router. And then you've got the wireless access point antennas on here. So it's all three in one device. Okay? So uh, in summary, we talked about using networks to carry data between hosts and clients and servers. We talked about communication protocols. Uh, and the importance of following rules. We talked about how larger networks are designed between access and uh, distribution and core layers. We also talked about the physical MAC address for Ethernet frames and the logical IP address for IP addressing. And we talked about creating a plan for networking and it introduced you to some of the ideas and concepts that we're going to be asking you to do in this week's lesson. Thank you very much.